Hi, Anthony Valerio from Business Events TV. We have John Daly, an ISIS legend, uh, all the way from the States. John, tell me about ISIS in the States and how you got started. Well, it was started a, a number of years ago with a group of people around a dining room table deciding that uh, there should be legislation put together for the event industry and the, and the industry become a power within itself in order to actually make laws and so on and so forth and also pulled all the cream of the crop from the industry together to work towards those goals. And you were a founding member? I was a founding member, yes. At that dinner, we threw $100 bills into a pot, and there's what it's, where it started from. And who else was at that dinner? Uh, Joe Jeff Goldblatt, uh, Angelo Benito. Uh, oh, my gosh, there were so many, so many. <laughs> a lot of legends. A lot of legends, yes, a lot of legends. And how did the Australian chapter start? The Australian chapter started, I think, about five or six years after the, the uh, chapter in the United States. I believe it was 1994, and Lena Maloof was a huge jump behind that. They had a, a lot of Australians actually had attended the special event, and we started telling them about, about ISIS, and they were attending our meetings, and then they pulled together 20 people and formed a chapter. And then a group of us came over to swear in the chapter, and here you are. Fantastic. Still going. And all these years later, how have you uh, imagined ISIS to be? Is this where you think the world's going to get to? I think that ISIS is doing extremely well. It's held together a lot of really great people. And I think that it has given a, a, a spoke to the wheel, if you will. And uh, I understand you've worked with a lot of uh, past presidents. Yes, I have. Tell me some uh, stories or some uh, challenges you've had. Well, uh, security is a, a very big deal. I've, I've worked with uh, four past United States presidents and, and many heads, heads of state actually around the world. But the biggest challenges uh, were security Although security was not nearly as difficult before, um, you know, before we had the terrorism starting around the world and so on. But it's, and it's also timelines. Everything is done. We go on a minute by minute sort of a timeline. They're honestly on a second by second timeline. And every single thing matters. So when do they bring you as an event specialist into the meetings? Um, I, w I would get involved usually quite a ways out and then we'd start the planning process, but then it was really then back towards the end before the events were coming about, maybe two, two months before the event, that we'd get really seriously involved again. So we'd book way out and then jump right in with both feet. And um, I guess the industry moving forward now, lead times are shortened. Much shorter. Lead times have gotten to be, everything is, the, it's the now age. Everything is, happens right now. And how do you, as an ISIS professional, uh, giving tips on future ISIS people in the industry, how would you tell them to manage those shorter time frames? I think that, uh, unfortunately, one of the things that's happened with uh, that, that now theory is that a lot of creativity has been taken away from the design side because there's no time to homogenize an idea. And I think a, a professional, it's your duty as a professional to tell the people that you're working with that you've got to have the time. You have to have the time. Not that you're trying to, you need to get them off some general ideas, bullet points, something like that. But then let them give you the time to homogenize your thoughts. Well, they're coming to you as an expert, so you, you should give them an idea of saying, if you want me to produce this properly, we need the time. Exactly, exactly. And I think that's something that we have to remember I remember very early on when I started in the industry, people did not have real high regard for event people. And then we, we, became, we, we came, to our, came into our own, as you would, uh, and, and had high regard, but we only got that because we showed people that we were professional and that yeah. we wanted to work in a professional manner. Well, speaking about professional, CSCP, um, uh, what are your thoughts on CSCP over in the States and also here in Australia? I think CSCP is an incredible uh, organization in the fact that, or not organization, certification, excuse me, because what it's doing is making people really study all aspects of the industry and not just know their own little niche, if you will. You have to know the whole thing of what's going on uh, in the industry as a whole. 
which makes for better teamwork, which makes for better events. Has CSP, as being a CSEP in the States, benefited you or a person um, in getting the job? I, I don't know that it, yes, yes it has in the fact that we were forced to do all of the training in order to get the quote unquote degree or certification. Because of that, I think it absolutely helped to be able to work with other people uh, within the industry that are not necessarily right in your own stable. Yeah. Yes, so the answer to that would be absolutely. Um, I'm also a CSCP and I love ISIS, uh -huh. um, but I find that uh, it's not very highly known here in Australia. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on promoting it and pushing it here? I think that people have to be able to use it. Um, be, uh, a lot of people don't use it on like their business cards now. A lot of people don't explain to other people what it is all about. I think it's, would, it's very good if you have a website to put on the fact that you are a CSEP and this is what a CSEP is for the, the lay person, if you will, that can, so they can understand what it is the, you've actually gone through in order to get that. And I understand with your challenges overseas and international events, tell us about the Paris World Cup. Paris World Cup was a, a big, big challenge. And it was a, it was a big challenge um, really because of the fact that it, of the distance and I would spend probably a week or two a month for the uh, 12 months prior to the event, uh, to, to World Cup. I spent a lot of time in Paris uh, putting things together, but working with um, the French was very, very difficult as, as a boisterous American. And quite, quite honestly, I have a big voice, as you can hear, and I, I had to learn to bring my voice down because uh, it was very offensive. And I had no idea I was being offensive. Did somebody tell you or you just had to find I out? I was told. I was told, thank goodness. I, I had a, um, a wonderful uh, driver translator that told me, you're really pushing people back and explained to me. And he said, you need to go in and make conversation. You need to be quiet. You, your voice, they think, you th people think that you're yelling at them and that you're being a blustering American. So it's understanding the culture first. Yeah, it's, it's understanding the culture. And I, I really uh, got to understand the culture and then worked an awful lot with the governments though, the government of, of uh, France, because we worked in historical monuments a lot. And we're, we were working in places that I had no idea the law, what the laws were and so on and so forth. So I had to be extremely inquisitive and I was always having a roadblock thrown in front of me that I, I didn't realize. So it's part of being quick decision making That's and right. changing? That's right, exactly, exactly. It's being on your feet, being aware, watching the ball, how so much, to speak. How much does experience come into that? An awful lot, <laughs> an awful lot. Yeah, you, you've got to, you, I think you have to have a little bit under your belt.